Hey, today I am going to give you nine essential phrases you must know in order to survive in a native English speaking country. Whether you're traveling or working abroad, you must, you must know these phrases. Are you ready? Well then, I'm teacher Tiffany. Let's jump right in. Number one, this one is bite the bullet. Excellent. Again, after me, bite the bullet. Great job. Now, what does this mean? Bite the bullet just means to face a difficult or unpleasant situation with courage. It's hard. It's not easy. And you might feel nervous, but you know what? Hey, I'm going to bite the bullet and move forward. Think about traveling. If you're coming to America, it's not easy, right? There are lots of words you need to know, lots of documents you have to prepare, but it's something that you will do. You're going to bite the bullet and organize everything you need to. Make sense? Excellent. All right. Here's the first example sentence. I have to bite the bullet and tell my boss about the mistake I made. Next sentence. Number two, John bit the bullet and admitted that he was wrong. He made the mistake and he had to get the courage to reveal it. And sentence number three, it's time to bite the bullet and start studying for the exam. You got it. Excellent. Now let me tell you the reason why it's so important for you to truly understand this phrase and know how to use it. This is frequently used in America. This phrase is used because it conveys the idea of facing challenges head on directly, even when it may be uncomfortable. It really is an amazing phrase and it conveys all of this in this simple phrase. This is why we as native English speakers, as Americans use it all the time. So again, number one, bite the bullet. Excellent. All right. Moving on to number two, number two, the next phrase you must know is hit the sack. Excellent. Again, hit the sack. Great job. Now listen, I literally text this to my best friend last night. I use it on a regular basis. This is a phrase you must understand. It literally just means to go to bed or go to sleep. It's that simple. We use it all the time and I want you to start using it so that you can start sounding like a native English speaker and again, survive in an English speaking country. So again, it just means to go to bed. Here's the first example sentence. I'm exhausted. So I'm going to hit the sack early tonight. I'm going to go to bed early. I'm tired. Here we go. Example sentence. Number two, it's getting late. So I think I should hit the sack. Yes. It's starting to make sense. Amazing. Sentence. Number three. After a long day at work, all I want to do is hit the sack. I love it. I love it. Now, why do we use this so often? So this phrase is commonly used to express the action of going to bed in a casual and colloquial manner. I could say I'm going to sleep or I'm going to bed. But this is a more casual way of saying I'm going to sleep. Hey, homie. Hey friend. I'm just going to hit the sack. Now I'm tired. Makes sense, right? Okay. We're going to move to number three, another phrase you must know to survive in an English speaking country, get the ball rolling. Excellent. Again, after me, get the ball rolling. Good job. Now this phrase is used in a professional environment, in an environment when you're with your friends at church, it's used all the time. It literally means to initiate 
or start a process or activity. You're getting something going. You're starting something in English. We say, get the ball rolling. Make sense. Excellent. All right. Check out this example sentence. Let's have an introductory meeting to get the ball rolling on this project. Hey, let's have a meeting to kind of get things started. Second example sentence. The manager wants to get the ball rolling on the new marketing campaign. You got it. Excellent. All right. Sentence number three, we need to get the ball rolling on planning the company picnic. We got to start this thing. Now, why is this so frequently used by native English speakers in America? This phrase is often used to encourage action and urge or push others to initiate a particular task or project. When someone uses this expression, this phrase, we all know those hearing it know, okay, Hey, we have to really get started instead of saying, Hey, let's start working. If they say, Hey, let's get the ball rolling. You know that they are serious. Makes sense, right? I love it. I love it. Okay. So far we have three phrases that will help you survive in a native English speaking country. Now I'm teaching you these phrases, but I want you to remember after these classes we have each week, you can go to the English with Tiffany app. You can download it for free, but again, download the app and you can practice what you are learning. My goal is to help you achieve your English goals this year. So download the app and start practicing what you are learning. All right, let's move on to number four phrase. Number four cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> I know you're like Tiff, wait a minute, an arm and a leg. Yes. Again, after me cost an arm and a leg. Excellent job. All right. What does this mean? It literally just means to be very expensive. Remember I'm teaching you these phrases so that you can survive in an English speaking country. I don't want you to be confused when a native English speaker uses one of these phrases cost an arm and a leg. What is wrong with Americans? No, it just means to be very expensive. Here's the first example sentence. The new smartphone model costs an arm and a leg. It's very expensive. Next, I wanted to buy that designer bag, but whoo, it cost an arm and a leg. And finally, eating out every day can cost you an arm and a leg. You got it. I see it on your face right now. You're understanding this phrase. Now this phrase, why do we use it so often? This phrase is popular because it emphasizes the idea of something being extremely pricey or costly. You're going to take my arm and my leg. Listen, I value my arm. I value my leg and it costs both of those. It's just emphasizing that it's pricey and costly. You got it. Excellent. All right, let's move on to phrase number five phrase. Number five, another really good one beat around the bush. Good again, beat around the bush. Great job. Now my students in my academy, the speak English with Tiffany Academy, They've heard me explain this phrase before. So they're probably smiling because they know what it means, but beat around the bush. It literally just means to avoid addressing an issue directly or to speak indirectly without getting to the point. For example, Hey, Samantha, why weren't you at work yesterday? Now the real reason she wasn't at work was because she went out with her friends, but here's Samantha's answer. Well, you know, um, you know, yesterday there were so many, um, things going on. And I also heard that you guys had a meeting and then I was thinking about, she's not answering the question directly. She's beating around the bush. 
You got it. All right. Here's the first example sentence. Stop beating around the bush and just tell me what you want. Sentence number two. It's frustrating when people beat around the bush instead of being straight forward. And sentence number three, please don't beat around the bush. You got it? Excellent. So why do Americans, native English speakers use this so frequently? This phrase is commonly used to express the idea of avoiding direct communication, either intentionally or unintentionally. And this happens very often. Why? We're human beings, right? There are moments when we feel uncomfortable and this isn't a phrase. This is an expression. This is a term we can use to describe when that happens. Hey, stop beating around the bush. I know what's happening. I'm human. I do it too. Stop beating around the bush and let me know what you want. You got it? Excellent. All right, let's move on to phrase number six, helping you survive in a native English speaking country. After me, call it a day. Excellent. Again, call it a day. Good job. All right. What does this phrase mean? It just means to decide to stop working or stop an activity for the rest of the day. You've been working all day. You've been doing this specific activity all day, and now you're ready to stop. In English, we say, call it a day. So for example, again, we use it all the time when I'm speaking to my mother or my father or speaking to my assistant, Hey, I I'm gonna, I'm typing. I'm gonna call it a day now. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. We use it literally all the time. And it just means I'm going to stop what I'm doing for the day. So here's an example sentence. We've been gardening for hours. So let's just call it a day and relax. Let's stop for the day and just chill. Sentence number two, let's call it a day and continue this meeting tomorrow. Hey, we're all tired. Let's call it a day and we can continue tomorrow. And sentence number three, I finished all my tasks for today. So I'm going to call it a day. You got it right. Excellent. Remember, I want you to start using these phrases because native English speakers use them all the time. And I want you to sound more natural. So here's the reason why we use this so often. This phrase is commonly used to indicate the end of a productive period or to express a desire to cease an activity. It's a little easier to say this than, Hey, I'm stopping today. I'm stopping this. I'm not doing this anymore. It's a little bit easier to say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to finish tomorrow. Right? So again, use this phrase, call it a day. You got it. Excellent. All right. Let's move on now to number seven phrase. Number seven survival English under the weather. Yes. Again, under the weather. Okay. Good job. Now, Literally, I'm teaching you phrases that I use on a regular basis as a native English speaker. I use this as well. And other Americans, other native English speakers use this all the time. When we get sick, we have a cold, we have the flu. Unfortunately, if we get COVID, if someone says, how are you doing? Hey, <coughs> I'm a little under the weather. You can say this instead of saying sick. It just means feeling unwell or not in good health under the weather. I want you to start using these phrases. So here's the first example sentence. I won't be able to make it to work today because I'm feeling under the weather. Yes, you got it. Sentence number two, she seems a little under the weather. So maybe she should stay home. And finally, sentence number three, his performance was not up to par because he was feeling under the weather. He wasn't feeling well. You got it. 
Excellent. So why do we use this so often? This phrase is frequently used as a euphemism to indicate illness without going into specific details. This is the key. Sometimes you don't want to say I have COVID. I have a cold. I have the flu. I, I have cramps. If you're a female, right? You just want to let the person know I'm not well, but I don't want to go into details. I am under the weather. You see how useful it is, right? Excellent. All right, here we go. Number eight phrase. Number eight, you need to survive on the same page. Literally my man, Fred, Fred, if you're watching this, so Fred was one of my students. He's still one of my students, but now he's a student leader in my academy and he is a really valuable member of our team. And Fred, I'll message him and he even uses it as well on the same page. He'll say, Hey, my friend, we're on the same page. Let's move forward with this project on the same page. All right. So again, after me on the same page, excellent. Now it literally just means having a shared understanding or agreement on a particular topic or plan. Again, having a shared understanding or agreement. We understand each other. We're in agreement. We know what the plan is. We are on the same page. You got it. I love it. All right. Here's sentence. Number one, let's make sure we're all on the same page regarding the project timeline. Sentence number two. Our team needs a meeting to get on the same page about our goals and sentence number three, we can only succeed if we're on the same page and working together. You got it. I love it. So why do we use this all the time? This phrase is commonly used to emphasize the importance of having everyone aligned and working towards a common goal. You got it. I love it. We're all working towards a common goal. And the phrase to describe this is on the same page. Now, the ninth phrase you must know in order to survive in a native English speaking country, get off someone's back. Yes. I love it again. Get off someone's back. Yes. Now we use this all the time. Here's the definition to stop criticizing, nagging or bothering someone. Just stop. Leave them alone. Stop bothering them. Get off of their back. Yes. Here's the example sentence. Please get off my back. Please stop nagging. Please stop bothering me. Please get off my back. Next. I want my parents to get off my back about my grades. You see how kids can say that, right? And finally, sentence three. The boss finally got off his employees back after seeing improvements. Yes, it's making sense. So why do we use this term, this phrase so often? This phrase is popular because it succinctly expresses the idea of someone relieving pressure or ceasing to criticize another person. Hey, stop. Think about it. someone's on your back. It's really heavy. And then they get off your back. Then they stop bothering you. Get off someone's back. Make sense. Excellent. All right. These are nine survival phrases that will help you in a native English speaking country. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I will talk to you in the next one. You still there? <laughs> you know what time it is. It's story time. Hey, I said it's story time. <laughs> All right. This story time is actually about you. It's about you and me and our relationship. Yes, you, you and me, but I want to start it off by telling you this short portion of something that happened in my life that led to me caring so much about you. So, with, there was a mud run. Uh, this was several years ago, literally 
Could it have been a decade ago? It was a long time ago. And a mud run is basically, uh, we had to run, I think, 3.5 miles, at, but it wasn't just a regular, like, 5K run. Instead, in the midst of the run, we were running through the woods. I mean, there were hundreds of people there. Running through the woods, doing obstacles. It was an obstacle course, right? And we also had to trudge through the mud. I mean, it, it was actually very fun, right? There were four of us. Me, my friend Monica, another friend Cleo, and actually our pastor's name was Reggie. So the four of us decided to do this mud run. We said, hey, this sounds exciting. We are all into exercising. And so I was telling my family that I was going to do this. And I was just letting them know I was going to do that this upcoming Sunday. My parents were like, hey, we're going to come and support you. And I was like, really? Again, I think I might have been in my 30s. It was just something we were doing for fun. My parents said, yeah, we're going to come. And it really meant a lot. So my parents were there. So the race started. They shot the gun. You know, the people that were organizing the event. And I went through the run. You know, I couldn't see my parents throughout the obstacle course because, again, we were in the trenches. We were in the midst of the woods. But my parents were waiting for me at the finish line. I remember the moment I ran through the woods and I hit the last obstacle. I came out and my parents, my dad and my mom, were like, yeah, go Tiff, go Tiff. And I got this renewed energy for the final five minutes of the race. I mean, it was, it was difficult. It was fun, but it was difficult. But when I saw my parents, they believed in me. They encouraged me. I suddenly got this renewed and burst of energy. Why am I telling you this? Because I want to be what my parents were for me. I want to be that for you. I know it's not easy learning English. I know it's not easy to study English and to go through the trenches studying on a regular basis. And when it gets challenging and sometimes making mistakes and feeling bad, I know it's not easy, but let me be your cheerleader. I believe in you. I believe you can do it. I am confident that you will achieve your English goals. So when you get down, when you feel discouraged, I want you to remember this face. <laughs> I want you to remember me in your corner. Like, yes, you can do it. I believe in you. I truly believe in you. And I believe that you achieving your English goals is literally going to change the world of the people around you. I've had so many students achieve their English goals and there was a ripple effect. Their children were affected. Their children started respecting them more, started looking up to them, their coworkers, their friends around them. I've had students move to America, move to Canada, all because they decided to push through and achieve their goals. I believe in you just like I believed in those students. Remember, even when it gets hard, even when you have to go through the trenches and trudge through the mud of English, know that you have a cheerleader in your corner rooting you on. I love you. I truly do. And I want you to achieve your goals. I'll talk to you next time.